why God waits to answer. Isaiah 30. Now wait till you arrive. I hear the rustling of the leaves. It's been said here at Times Square Church, if you don't come with your Bible, you're naked. This is your clothing. Amen. Robed with his word. Verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest till ye be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength, and you would not. But you said, No, for we will flee upon horses, therefore shall you flee, and we will ride upon the swift, therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, at the rebuke of five shall you flee, till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain, as an ensign on a hill. And therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will be exalt, he will be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are they that wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. When he hears your cry, he will answer thee. Hallelujah. We thank you, O God, for your precious word. Your word is our lamp, it's our strength. And I stand as a shepherd of this flock to humble myself before you, Jesus. And I ask for a special touch from heaven, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let me speak as a shepherd does to his flock. Lord, I'm only one, but I ask you, Lord, to use this vessel this morning. Sanctify me, purge me, let me speak the pure, holy word that will produce life. Oh, God, we thank you for your presence here this morning. You were here since we opened the service, and you're going to be here all day. Now, Lord, apply the word to our hearts. Holy Spirit, bring forth unction. Bring forth an anointing. Let the word heal us this morning. Let the word strengthen us. Let the word uh, reprove us and rebuke us if it must, only to heal us, that you may be gracious unto us. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Why God waits to answer. Now, I've read to you from Isaiah chapter 30. Don't turn there, but it goes back to chapter 29. This is during the reign of Hezekiah in Jerusalem and Judea and in Judah. The prophet Isaiah is contemporary at this time along with the prophet Micah. These were the two prophets that spoke during these times. If you want to know how the times were uh, during this period that we're discussing this morning, you read the whole book of Micah, and you get the picture of how Jerusalem and Judah are under judgment at this time. And Isaiah is sent by the Spirit of God to Jerusalem and the inhabitants there and God's people, and he's got a two-pronged message. First of all, he warns of a horrible warfare that was coming, and second, there was a promise of God's deliverance that they would simply trust and obey. <clears throat> the prophet Isaiah stands before God's people in Jerusalem, and he gives an awesome prophecy. He said, you're going to be going through a great test of faith, and this is all in the 29th chapter, and I'm paraphrasing. He said, there's looming before you a great test of faith. <clears throat> you're going to wake up one day, he said, and look out over the walls of Jerusalem. You're going to see the Assyrian army surrounding you. And he said, within one year, it's going to happen. You see, God always warns his people. He always warns us. And he's, the prophet Isaiah tearfully is standing before the people, and they're really being judged at this time for an apostasy. apostasy. In the city of God, the place of his anointing, where his fire fell on the altar, <clears throat> was going to come under an attack. They would be besieged. And there's going to be such uh, a, a besiegement that there would be towers raised against them where there would be bridges made so that they could uh, go from their towers right to the top of the wall. They're going to be battering rams, battering the walls night and day to try to tear down the walls of security. <clears throat> These battering rams were going to be an attempt to crush every protecting wall. They were going to go through the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. 
They said, the, the prophet said, your trial is going to become so heavy, you're going to be humbled to the very dust, you're going to lay prostrate, and the only strength you're going to have left when this battle is over is just a bare whisper. You're just going to be able to whisper. All your strength is going to be gone. Now, folks, this sounds very familiar to me. It sounds like the same kind of warning the Holy Spirit has given to us in the New Testament. It's a warning that we, as God's people in the last days, are going to go through spiritual warfare, that the devil's going to come. You wake up one day and you're surrounded by enemies. You wake up one day and you find yourself in a battle for your life. You find the devil coming with his battering rams and his towers and bangs and hits, and everything out of hell comes against you. And there are people sitting among us here this morning in the balcony, main floor, around me, surrounding me. You don't know who they are. I don't know. Only the Holy Ghost does. He's the mind reader. And he knows exactly what you are going through this morning. He knew that all week, and he prepared a message for many of you. Some of you are visitors. God sent you here this morning to deliver you, to bring you into a new realm of discovery in the Spirit. He's going to help you this morning. If you just say right now, Holy Spirit, open my ears to hear. If you're sitting here this morning and your mind is wondering, bring it to captivity. Every thought to the obedience of the Lord Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit is faithful to his flock. He is faithful to his people. Folks, we serve a loving Heavenly Father who wants nothing more than to deliver his people. He's called a deliverer. He is a deliverer. And that's what he has in mind for you this morning. Suddenly, some of you have been cast into the trial of your life. You're being tested in your faith. And some of you have been so overwhelmed, you've literally been crushed and humiliated. And you get up each day and you wonder if you can go on. There's a doctor in this church, a fine man of God, and just recently he was sued. And... Uh, taking a stand for the Lord and going through it. And he said, Brother Dave, every day I wake up, there's something new. There's something worse. There's always another evil report. I am being battered. I'm at my wit's end. I got a letter. Uh, you know, we receive uh, thousands of letters from our mailing list that our messages are sent all over the United States and around the world. <clears throat> and this week, a letter came to me from a sister in the Midwest. And she said, Dear Brother David, I attend a Holy Ghost-filled church. I've grown more in the past two years than in all my past life. But for the past six months, I've been going through a fiery trial of my faith. And I don't think I can take much more. Why does everything have to be so hard? I have met the devil face to face. And it seems like he hits me in some different way every day. Every day there's another evil report. He's been robbing me financially. He's trying to discourage me, so I'll quit. I've become so weary. It shows on my face and now in my attitude. Every day just brings more pressure. Why can't things settle down for a while? I bind Satan. I praise the Lord all times, but it seems to be to no avail. I know the word is true. I'm listening all day to godly tapes, but I can hardly make it through the day anymore. I'm so tired trying to be strong. I'm at my wit's end, and I really don't know what's happening. And we get letters like that from all over the world, people going through the test of their life. The prophet Isaiah sees this uh, <clears throat> message from the Lord. He hears the voice of the Lord, and he said, even though I warned you of what's going through, even though I have warned you, <clears throat> I'm telling you that God, if you'll trust him, is going to bring you through miraculously. God is going to deliver you. You're going to be surrounded by armies. You're going to have battering rams, battering at your walls. You're going to go through such a test that's going to bring you finally prostrate on your face in the dust where you can only whisper, but I'm telling you now, you don't have to do anything about it. You're going to just trust the Lord, and he's going to carry you through. And one day, in his time, every enemy will be gone. And it'll be just like a bad dream that passes away. <clears throat> he gave, in, in chapter 29, there are eight verses. The four first, four first verses of chapter 29 are all woes. What you're going through. 
Folks, hasn't the Holy Spirit warned us that we're going to be in spiritual battles? Hasn't he warned us that we're going to go into a fiery furnace? He said, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. But he said, what's happening to you is common to all of God's people. But God will in his own time and his way make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Even though he warns us, he said, in the last days we'll be persecuted. We will be tried. And just when you think your strength is going to fail, when you're at your lowest, when all seems hopeless, at the peak of your crisis, the Bible says God will take over. You read 29, Isaiah 29, verses 5 to 8. And oh, what a, what tremendous promises are given here. Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers shall be like small dust. The multitude of the terrible ones. And in fact, in Hebrew, those very important people who come against you shall be as chaff that passeth away. It shall be as an instant, suddenly. Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire, and the multitude of those that come against Jerusalem, her aerial, even all that fight against her and her mul- and her munitions, and that have distressed her shall be as a dream and a night vision. And here's a wonderful promise. God says, the multitude of your enemies shall become like fine dust. The multitude of the ruthless, like the chaff, shall blow away. The Lord will visit upon your enemies, is what he's saying with thunder, with earthquake, with great noise, with storm and tempest, and a devouring fire. And you know what the prophet is saying? Very suddenly, when you think it's hopeless, when you think you can't go another step, suddenly, suddenly, the Lord shall come with thunder and lightning and earthquake. The Assyrians who have schemed to destroy you will themselves be put to shame. And that's all through chapter 29 and also the first part of chapter 30. He said they're going to wake up into a delusion. They're going to have empty souls. The devil's plans and schemes will fade away like a bad dream. God will lift you up out of the pit of despair. And everyone who's come against you, wait, warred against you, shall be consumed with his voice. They will no longer distress you. And the dream will pass. And you will come into his glory. And you will come into the increase of bread, the scripture says. Your bread will be increased. It means the blessing of God. Folks, we today have even greater promises than they had. Scripture makes it very, very clear that we live in a time of greater promises. For he hath obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much more he is the mediator of a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. We have all the promises Jerusalem had, and we have all the promises of the New Testament. Yes, God has warned you. He has warned me. He's warned us all that there are times that come that are going to test the very righteous. And I want to tell you, and I want you to hear me well, the more righteous you are, the closer you walk to Jesus, the hungrier you are for him, the more you seek his face, the more you are going to be tried and tempted and tested as no other Christian. Dear sister on our mailing list, this is, uh, sent us the, the, this note. Said, Dear Brother David, I feel that of the Lord to send you these encouraging words from Brother Frangipani's book, The Three Battlegrounds. And I want to read just a paragraph. And, and here's what it said. In these closing moments of this age, the Lord will have a people whose purpose for living is only to please God with their lives. You know, there are people like that. Their only purpose for living is to please God. Do you know the price that kind of person is going to pay? In them, God finds his own reward for creating man. They become his worshipers. Oh, thank God for worshipers. If you are a true worshiper, watch out. They are on earth only to please God, and when he is pleased, they are pleased. The Lord takes them farther and through more pain and more conflicts than other men. Outwardly, these people seem to be smitten of God and afflicted. Yet to God they are his beloved. When they are crushed like the petals of a flower, they exude worship, the fragrance of which is so beautiful and rare that angels weep in quiet 
at their surrender. One would think that God would protect these who worship. He would guard them in such a way that they would not be marred or broken. Instead, they are marred and broken more than any other men. Indeed, the Lord seems pleased to crush them, putting them to grief. For in the midst of the physical and emotional pain, their loyalty to Jesus Christ grows pure and more perfect. In the face of persecution, their love and worship toward God becomes all-consuming. Folks, that's the purpose of suffering. That's the purpose of being tried, that God may bring us to a place of sweetness, a place of rest, that we can come to this, he said, in, in quietness and confidence shall be your security, that you're secure because you have test, you've been tested of the Lord and you didn't murmur, you didn't complain, you didn't quit, but you grew in Christ. It produced the nature of Christ. It produced the beauty of Jesus in you. That's why some of you are going through it. You can't understand it. But Pastor Dave, never have I loved him more. I've studied, I've wept, I've cried, I've prayed, I walked circumspectly before God. Why am I going through the trial that I'm going through? Some of it is financial for some of you. Some of it's children. Some of it's family. Some of it's physical. I don't know what you're going through today. Is it your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your, your children? Is it just your own physical pain? What is it you're going through? I don't know, but he does. But he said that's common. That is not to be considered something unusual. And if God doesn't deliver you immediately, I can tell you one thing. He'll give you all the grace you need to see it through. There was a persistent woman who cried night and day for justice and a vengeance. She kept coming to the judge. And the judge said, because she bothers me, I'll answer. But the Lord Jesus himself, and shall not God avenge or protect his own elect, which cry unto him night and day, though he bear along with them. I tell you, and this is Jesus speaking. Jesus, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. God said, make sure you understand that the Lord will fight your battles. The Lord will do it. Now, beloved, Jesus was the fulfillment given to all the prophets of the promise. You read about the promise all through the Old Testament. That was Jesus. That was the Messiah coming. It was given to all the prophets. I want you to go to Luke, please, the first chapter of Luke. I'm going to use something to give you great encouragement. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Luke 1, beginning to read verse 68. You should read this every week or every time you're downcast. Luke, the first chapter. Chapter, beginning read, uh, verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. This is <clears throat> Zechariah speaking. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Who is that power of salvation, that horn? Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hallelujah. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from what? Our enemies and from the hand of how many? All that hate us. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being what? Delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him. How long? All the days of our life without fear. All the days of our life, God dealing with your enemies in in your household, your enemies on the job, your enemies on the street, demonic powers, principalities and powers of darkness, whatever it may be that comes against you, the Lord says, I will deliver you from all your enemies so that you live out all your days in peace and rest in the Lord. I want you to go to Isaiah, back to Isaiah 30. The 30th chapter of Isaiah again. 
You see, God comes to Jerusalem with these wonderful promises. He said, if you'll call on me, I'll hear you. You'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it, when you turn to the right or to the left. He said, if you'll simply call on me, I will hear you, and I will answer you. And he said, I will deliver you, and I'll handle all your enemies. <clears throat> but the scripture makes it clear that Israel, or rather that Jerusalem and Judah, did not listen to the prophet, did not listen to the word of God. And the scripture says they panicked, and they did not consult the Lord, but they had their own committee meetings. They met in private, and they said, who sees it? God doesn't see it. And they counseled among themselves, and they did not call on the name of the Lord. They didn't seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but they turned to the arm of the flesh. They got on swift horses and sent ambassadors to Egypt. They went to Zoar and, and, and to Haines, and they sent their ambassadors on swift horses, and they turned to the arm of the flesh. Look at chapter 30, verse 15, if you will, please. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Chapter 30, uh, no, that, that's uh, chapter 29, 13. I want you to uh, go to chapter 30, verse 13, 15 again. This is chapter 30, verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest... Shall ye be saved in quietness and confidence shall be your strength and you would not. Now, folks, look at me, please. This is the prophet Isaiah standing before the people. He said, the Assyrians are coming within a year. And he said, all you have to do is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. All you do is cry out to the Lord and he will come and deliver you. And while they're gathering around you, while all this turmoil is around you, you're going to have your mind at rest and peace. And that's going to be your strength. That's going to see you through if you'll just take my word. But he said, you would not. You would not listen to that. You wouldn't take it. They panicked. And they said, no, we want to see action. The Lord works too slow. Oh, isn't that just the way we are? God has made us great and precious promises whereby we're made partakers of his divine nature. You know the hardest thing it is for a Christian or a child of God to do is to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. We want something to happen. So we get on our swift horses just like Israel and we run down to Egypt. Egypt is flesh. Egypt is man-made methods. You see, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost is our comforter. And, whether, and rather than accept that and rest in that, we run to our friends. We get on the telephone. We look for some human comforter. Who do you run to in your bridle? Who do you go to? Who hears your ear? Do you run to the Lord or do you immediately pick up your phone? You say, I've got a good friend. This friend has to, this friend will help me out. The Bible says Jesus is our healer. And rather than rest on that, we run to our doctors, we run to our hospitals, we run to our experts. We really don't trust the Lord. You and I know that. When we are in battle, when we're in trouble, we run to some counselor, we run. We have, we have Christians now that just go to the Christian bookstore. Look at all the people lined up on the how-to books. How to find happiness, how to solve your loneliness problem. There must be 10,000 books on how to, to overcome loneliness, written by lonely people who don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> they're trying to solve their own problems. God said, if you will seek me, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and turn to the left. All God said, Israel, or Judah, Jerusalem, Judah, will you just lean on me? Folks, I'm telling you, we don't do that. Somehow, this has to get into your heart. I've stood in this platform, in this pulpit, this past year especially, I've been looking back over the messages I've preached and the notes. Folks, I have preached more on this subject than any other subject this past year. Brother Carter has stood here and others have stood here trying to get us to believe God. 
not to lean on the arm of the flesh and to rest in his promises. It has been coming at us time and time again. And God must know, he must know, and I know he does, that many of us have been grieving him because I can preach the kind of message I'm preaching this morning about just trusting his word and leaning not on the flesh, but leaning on his word and his promises. And people will come up to me and say, Brother, that was a good word. I can meet him out on the street. Boy, that was good. Boy, Lord, touch me. That's Sunday by Wednesday. The trial is raging around them and you thought I hadn't said a word about trust. Everything they heard Sunday morning or Sunday night, they've forgotten. And they're on the telephone. They're in panic. They're on their swift horses running to Egypt. And I'm telling you, that wounded the heart of God. God was wounded. He's grieved. Because rather than being in a secret closet pouring out their hearts, they're then sitting in the council rooms with the Egyptians who were heathen worshiping idols. And they're pouring out their heart to these Egyptian lords. These very Egyptian lords that God once wounded and destroyed. The posterity of these people. And here they are with their seed sitting down in these council rooms saying, Look, the Assyrians are coming against us. We're going to be in the battle of our life. We are weak. We can't stand it. We will pay any price if you'll come and protect us. What does, how does the heart of God feel when his own children, having all these promises, turn away from him and run on swift horses to the camp of the Egyptians and they're unburdening and unbosoming themselves to these men? And God said, it's a shame. He said, they can't help you. And the prophet is incredulous. He can't believe their blindness. He said, you've, you've lost your discernment. Woe to the rebellious children that go down to Egypt and have not asked at my mouth. And they go to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. And the prophet comes along and he said, you know why you don't hear the word of God? For the Lord's poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and he's closed your eyes. You so many times trying, every battle has been a test. He's tested you and tested you, failed and you failed and you failed. And here they are at an ultimate test. Folks, I want to tell you something. If you've never heard anything ever been preached in this pulpit before, listen now. Listen to a pastor who's learning. I'm sorry I had to wait till I'm this age in my 60s to learn some of these lessons. But you can preach this gospel all your life. You can talk about faith. You can preach it. You can preach about trusting the Lord. But I want to tell you, it only comes through trials. It only comes through tests. And I wish I had learned in some of the former tests that I wouldn't have to be tested so severely at this time in my ministry and my age that I would have to go through such, such severe testing till I finally learned this lesson to just step back and trust God and call on his name and let him take care of everything. I have learned in a time of slander and abuse to stand still and see the salvation of God and not try to defend myself for the house of God. I used to be a fighter. There was a time 10 years ago, before I came to New York, you ever touched me? You came near me. You'll pick yourself up off the street. Bless God, I'm a prophet. I didn't say that, but I felt it. You touched me and you're dead. No, folks, that's all gone. And you know why? Because in the test, you're not to retaliate. You're not to take the battle in your own hands. You don't sit around questioning, is God doing this or the devil doing this? It don't matter. If he's chastening you, he said, blessed are you, whom the Lord loves. You say, well, God, you must love me an awful lot to test me like this. But some of you are not there yet. You're still fighting. 
somebody talks about you on the job, start a rumor, you go start another one. You're going to retaliate. You're going to get even. That's not the Christ way. The test you're going through, you're going to sit around. When, when do you stop complaining and say, oh God, where are you? Why are you doing this to me? Lord, I've never loved you more than I do. Why, 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 why? That's the only word some of us get out of our trials. And the hardest thing to do, and I'm telling you this, and it's the only way, is to rest and stand still and say, God, teach me the lessons I want to learn. Open my mind. Open my heart. There's so much that he wants to teach us. You say, well, Brother Dave, I've been walking with God for 30 years. Well, folks, I've been walking with God longer than that. And as a pastor, I'm still learning. You're going to learn too. Forget how long you've been walking with God. I know people walk with God 50 years and they're still babies. They've learned hardly anything. And they don't understand why the Lord keeps testing and trying them. Hallelujah. God was greatly offended when they panicked and rushed down to Egypt. God calls it outright rebellion when we refuse to, when we refuse to rest on his promises. Woe to the rebellious children that take counsel but not of me. They've not asked at my mouth. They depend on horses and they trust in chariots because there are many, but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither do they seek the Lord. <clears throat> Beloved, all through the Word, we have been warned that we're going to go through this, and that God tells us that if you're a true worshiper, you're going to be tried more than anything else. But the truth is, the majority of God's people do not rest on the promises. They don't. Now, God saw this feverish activity going on. He saw them rushing down to Egypt. Can you see their ambassadors and their princes? They've got swift horses, and they're all excited. They're going to work out their own problem. Go ahead, get on your swift horse. The Bible said the horses that are following you are just as swift, and you can't outrun your problems. There's no place on earth you can outrun what you're going through. Wherever you go, it's still there. Because the horses, the Bible said, that after you are swift as your horses. Just about you think, oh, that's all over. You turn around, there it is. Still following you. No, you can't outrun your problems. And, you, and, and these men panic. They're trying to outrun their problem. Look now with me. I, and here's the heart of my message. Verse 18, chapter 30. God looks down. At it, and he says, and therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you. I'll wait. Look at me, please. God says, okay, you don't need me right now because you're so busy doing it yourself. I'm just going to wait. I want to be gracious. I want to hear you. I'm ready. I, I have a plan. I'll do it my time and way. I'm testing you to see if you just sit and wait and rest. Get off your horse. But he said, and this is the reason why God has not answered many of you. Because you're still so busy trying to work it out. Figure it out. And Lord said, okay, I'm going to wait till you exhaust all your human effort. I'm going to wait until you completely are exhausted and say, well, to whom shall I go? That's where he wants you. Where you are hopeless in the flesh. There's no man. There's no woman. There's no program. There's nothing on the face of the earth is going to help you. And you say, all right, God, I quit. I resign. You do it. You do it. <clears throat> David said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. And my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my sorrow before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. God said, come on to me now. 
and pour out your soul. Tell me what you've tried. I understand. I've followed you. I've watched you. The Lord said, wait. I'll wait till you're exhausted. I'll wait till you're tired of trying to figure it out. And you just, you just fall back and say, God, it's absolutely beyond me. I can't fight it. I can't do anything about it. I can't change it. I can't, my finances, my family, Lord, it's there. It's been thrust upon me. I have to just endure it, but oh God, you're going to have to give me strength. You have to figure this whole thing out. And the Lord said, Let, let's, let's go on. Hallelujah. He said, I'm going to wipe away your tears in the next verse. For the people that dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, thou shalt weep no more. For he will be very gracious <laughs> unto you. Uh, he was very gracious unto thee at what? The voice of thy cry. And when he shall hear it, he will answer thee. <clears throat> the first message, uh, uh, it was the second message I heard Pastor Carter preach. When a cry becomes a prayer, is that it? And that's when I got on my car phone and called him to come down here and preach, which led to his being here. And I know he preaches this, and I know how diligent I preach it. But folks, somehow, by the Holy Spirit, it has to find its mark today and change us as a people. God cannot build a strong church on people who are not convinced that God is on their side, that God sees and knows all, and that he alone, by faith, to those who call and cry to his name. Folks, I don't do anything anymore. Anything that comes my way, you know where I go? I don't get on the phone. <clears throat> I don't call Pastor Carter. I don't call any pastor anywhere on the face of the earth. I don't even sit down and talk over with my wife. I love her, but I, I don't take my problems to her. <clears throat> my wife, I love her. She, she can't touch that space in me. She can't help me there. She can't heal me. We can encourage one another, but it doesn't touch that spot. And so I go into my study and I shut the door. Or I go out, get in my car and go to Pennsylvania and go up on a mountain. And I'll spend three or four hours just walking and crying my heart out. I unburden my whole soul. I tell him everything. I weep, I cry, and I say, God, you said and I use this very verse, you said, when I cry, you'll hear me and you'll deliver me. And I'll tell you after, when I come out, when I come out of that secret closet or when I come away from that walk with God, <clears throat> there's something inside of me that can settle on this in quietness and confidence is your strength. There is strength that comes. God reassures you. Then you're not looking to the arm of flesh. You don't have to call anybody. You don't have to talk it over with anybody. That doesn't mean you're a law to yourself or that you're just a loner. But then when you come out, you're talking faith. You're talking God's on the throne. You're not trying to figure anything out. But folks, God has waited and waited sometimes on me. And He's going to stand by and wait. You can, you, you can, you can pray for eight hours a day. You can seek God with all, all that you are in the flesh. You can read chapter after chapter after chapter. You can read whole books. You read the whole Bible. But if you don't have faith in His promises, in His Word, nothing's going to happen. For the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. And they shall be to you a shame and a reproach. You turn to the flesh... It ends in nothing but shame and reproach. But oh, I love this. He will be very, not just gracious, but very gracious to you at the voice of your cry. And when he hears it, he will answer thee. All right, before I close, now go to chapter, uh, chapter 30, verse 20 and 21. And the, the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. How many of you are going through that right now? Bread of affliction? Water of trouble? Where's your hand? Am I preaching to myself? I said, how many of you are being tested and tried? Raise your hand. Quit hiding. 
Well, there's still some of you hiding. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if this, doesn't, if this doesn't apply to you today, get the tape by Wednesday it will. <laughs> Verse 20, and though the Lord give you the bread of adversity, who gives it to you? The bread of adversity, the water of affliction. Yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more, but then I shall see thy teachers. And folks, you know what this is? This is revelation. This is, who, who is our teacher? The Holy Spirit. These are revelations of the Holy Spirit. We'll never, won't be hidden to you anymore because you're trusting in the Lord. They're going to be revelations of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to guide you now. He's going to lead you through. He's going to tell you how and what to do. Sometimes you just say, stand still. Don't do anything. And then he will give you direction. There'll be a revelation of who God is, who Jesus is. And you'll be standing there, but you won't be standing still. You'll be learning. There'll be a process of learning. Your teacher will not be hidden anymore. Nothing will be hidden from your eyes. You'll be learning. Verse 21. And thine ears shall hear word behind thee saying, This is the way walk ye in it when ye turn to the right hand. And when you turn to the left, he said, I'm going to make your path clear to you. You're going to know and understand. And folks, I don't have time. You go through the rest of the chapter and it's all about how God's going to bless you and prosper you in the, in the spirit of Christ and the glory of God, how he's going to lead you and give you the bread of increase. Hallelujah. He's on the throne. He's not going to fail. Some of you need a baptism of faith this morning. You need to quit figuring things out. Some of you haven't slept good for a long time. God wants to give you a Holy Ghost sleeping pill today. <laughs> that you can go to bed tonight and rest and say, Lord, you take it from here. Will you stand, please? Now, beloved, look my way. I've been in the ministry long enough to understand that God doesn't speak like this unless he has reason. He knows what he's doing. The Holy Ghost knows what he's doing. If I'm convinced of anything, it's that. And he's trying to accomplish something in your heart. First of all, I want you to know if you're going to seek God with all your heart, you've got today to settle this matter. You're going to be attempted. You're going to be tried. You're going to be tested. You're going to be persecuted. How many understand that now? The closer you get to God, the more fierce it can get. I tell you what, though, the Lord won't keep you in that condition. He comes to deliver. But do you understand now the reason why he waits to answer? He's waiting for you to quit figuring it out. He wants you to quit running around trying to solve your own problem. He wants you to just give him simple childlike faith and say, Jesus, everything I'm in right now is beyond me. <clears throat> and I know some of you need strength. It's not that you doubt the Lord. It's not that you uh, have any intention of ever leaving or wounding him. But in the flesh, you're weak. Some have only been saved a year or two, maybe. And you don't understand. It may be that everything's going well, but something inside. The enemy comes at your faith. He comes at you. He comes at your family. He comes with worry. He comes with fear. And those are the battering rams of the enemy. Fear. Guilt, condemnation, and so many things. He just batters and batters and batters. What are you going to do? Are you going to panic? Or are you going to stand on his word? He said, I'll make a way of escape. I will. I'll keep you from falling. And I'll present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. I will. I will. I will. And that's what faith rests on. Oh, God, you do it. I'm telling you, I stand here now because he's brought me out. 
He has delivered. He brought me into his banqueting house and his banner over me is love. Hallelujah. God wants to bring everybody in this church this morning out of your pit of despair. He wants you to walk out of here with a song in your heart, joy in your step, having committed everything to him, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. I want, first of all, the first invitation up the balcony here on the main floor, those first that are going through a severe attack. You'd have to say, I'm like the children of Israel. The enemy has surrounded me. The battering rams are on me. And I, I have just been tried and tested as never before in my life. I'm really going through it, Pastor Dave. I want you to get out to your seat first. Balcony, go to either uh, side of the stairs and come down any aisle. I want to pray that God, this morning, give you a great victory. That He'll lift this burden from your heart today. <clears throat> if you're backslidden, if you're not right with Jesus, come and follow these that are coming. Say, I, I, need, I need to come back to my first love for Jesus. Maybe you've never been right with God. Come and make it right, right now. God will deliver you. Please move close. And move in close because there will be a lot of people coming. All right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You that are standing here, that came forward, Holy Spirit just spoke some of my heart. I don't think we realize how serious and how, uh, what a storm some of you are going through. I'm going to ask a question I feel led the Holy Spirit to ask. And this is not to be showy or anything else, but to show how serious it is for some of you. How many of you have gone through it so badly lately? The enemy's even whispered to your heart, there's no purpose in living. You might as well take your life. Raise your hand, please. Raise it high. That's what I thought. That's why the Holy Spirit laid it in my heart. Have you been coming here for how long? Nine months? God's going to give you a great deliverance this morning. That will never come again. Isn't the Lord wonderful that He knows what you're going through and He prepares a precious word just to lift you out of that. And it reminds you how much He cares. Huh? Isn't that wonderful? Now I'm going to come against these lying spirits. I'm going to speak the word of faith. I'm one of his shepherds. He's anointed me for this. And I want you to know, I want you to believe the Lord, but I want you to believe with me that as I pray, God's going to break the hold of this lying spirit that's trying to bring you down. The devil only holds you through lies. Once the lie is broken, once it's exposed, he has no power, he has no authority. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I want you to just lift both hands. You don't have to weigh up. Just, just, that's, Lord, I surrender. Father, turn to Matthew 18th chapter, please. The 18th chapter of Matthew. Where have all the children gone? First ten verses, chapter 18 of Matthew. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, Except you be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same as greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, 
For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off, cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into the life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet be cast into everlasting fire. If the eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It's better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Heavenly Father, I pray for a special touch from you tonight. I need quickening in my body. I need that touch of the Holy Ghost. Lord, give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying tonight. Lord, there's a truth here you're trying to convey to your body and help us to understand it. Help us to receive it right now in Jesus' name. Let your Spirit be upon me. We take your authority over all demonic opposition, all principalities and powers of darkness, that there be absolutely nothing hinder the word of the Lord. Quicken my body, my spirit. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me tell you right off, this is all about spiritual children. We're not talking about natural, physical children. This is about spiritual children. In Romans 8.16 it says, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Very few have seen and understood this passage that I just read to you. A child of God. Now, folks, what does that really mean, that I am a child of God? The word is used so flippantly in the church of Jesus Christ without understanding what it truly means. A child of God as a believer who knows he's not in control of his own life, that he is absolutely helpless as a little child, that is what a believer is. A child of God is one who acknowledges and knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is totally, wholly dependent on his Heavenly Father. The kind of children I'm describing tonight do not exist outside the doors of this church. They don't exist in the sinful, wicked world because they are all self-sufficient people. Uh, ask Frank Sinatra who's saying, I did it my way. And that's what they say out there because they are not dependent on anybody. The whole American system is be self, be independent and uh, self-reliant. That's why we have so many self-help books, even in the church. You go to a Christian bookstore now, and 90% of what you hear and read is not theology, is not doctrine. It's how to overcome, how to be self-motivated, how to deal with fear and uh, loneliness, and it's coping, and it's self-help, it's self-love, it's self-promotion. And sadly, we have very few real children in the church of Jesus Christ today. And I was praying, and, and, and suddenly the Holy Spirit asked me a question, and that's why I went to this chapter. And the Holy Spirit said to me, David, where are all my children? The Lord was speaking about, where are all my children? Where are the children? Where have they gone? In other words, where are all those who were so dependent on me and now have turned to self-help and turned to different ways and means to cope with their problems and turning to one another? Where have my children gone? Where are those who are totally dependent upon me as little children? <clears throat> Jesus sets a child in the midst of his disciples now, these are godly men. These are followers of Jesus Christ. And they're walking in the light that they've received. And Jesus gives us an illustrated sermon. One of the most powerful illustrated sermons in the Bible. Here is God in flesh and a little child. He, he brings out of all the children that have flocked around. He brings a little child and sets before these his own disciples. Now, remember, these are converted men. Uh, in, in the light of that which Christ had given to them, the gospel they knew at that time. He called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say unto you, unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now this is an amazing, shocking thing that Jesus is doing here. He looks into the face of righteous men and he says, unless you become as this little child, you 
can't enter the kingdom of God. And what he's calling, he says, unless you are converted, and in the Greek, the, the word there means revolution in thinking. He said, unless you change the way you are thinking, unless there's a revolution in your thinking, it's going to be difficult for you to enter into the fullness and the understanding of my kingdom. He's not saying you're going to be, go to hell, you're not going to be lost. But he, he, he's saying, unless you change your thinking in your relationship with me, unless you become like this child. They had just been arguing and asking the question, who's going to be greatest among us in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus is saying, no, wait a minute. Unless there's a revolution, unless you change the way you look at me, unless you change the way you see the kingdom of God, you're not going to make it. It's a very strong thing that he's saying here. And become like children. This is a powerful thing that Jesus is saying. And we've missed the significance of, of this whole message. It's not just about the children of the flesh. Now, certainly God, God is grieved over what is happening to our children in America today. He sees the incest. He sees the, the abuse. He sees all of this. And, and certainly God is going to judge that. There's no way our Heavenly Father is going to sit back and let that happen. That's the grief of God's heart. There's no question about that. But this is not about child abuse. Not in the physical realm. Not at all. He's saying you've got... You are going to have to revert, not to childishness, but to a childlike attitude in your relationship to me. In how you're going to walk with me. You see, Jesus himself was totally dependent upon his Heavenly Father. He said, I do nothing except what I see my father do. And he saw it written in his heart. And he's trying to convey to his disciples, you're going to have to walk with me like I walk with my heavenly father. I'm going to be gone, and you're going to have to learn that you are as helpless as this child that stands before you. Now, Jesus is not speaking of a single childlike characteristic. I wouldn't want a church, I wouldn't want to pass a pastor church that has a toddler's mentality. I don't want you to go back and have the characteristics of these babies that are always uh, crying. And I, I don't want to see any characteristic in my own life where I, like, like my little children and my grandchildren, me, mine, and no, no, no. He's not talking about Childlike characteristics whatsoever. We, I, you know, we, 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 we look at this in time we say, well, he wants us to have simple childlike faith and simple childlike trust, but it goes deeper than that even. Much deeper than that. This is about, it's not about the nature of a child, but the circumstance of a child. In other words, the, the very condition of the child. Here's, here's God in the flesh, and here's a little child. A child that can't feed itself, can't clothe itself, can't make any decisions on its own. And the only weapon it has when it's hungry, when it's in need, is a cry. Do you understand that the child that cries gets the attention? And that's why all through this book it says, all through Psalms, it says, cry, cry, cry. In trouble, cry. In problems, cry. Need direction? Cry out to the Lord. David said, I cried, I cried, I cried, I cried. He said, I was a baby. I was a child in his arms. Oh, I know it says in the Bibles, uh, the Bible that we are not to, we're, we're not to be like a child, but we're to grow to manhood, that we're to put away childish things, uh, and we're not to be children in understanding. That has to do with, with, with the, with the way we deal with other people. It has to do with uh, our job. It has to do with relationships. It has to do with doctrine. But when it comes to our relationship with Jesus and how we're going to walk this Christian walk, there is only one way, Jesus said, and that is childlike dependency on the Lord Jesus Christ, on the Heavenly Father. Absolute dependency. Yes, we've got to learn to trust God. Yes, without faith it's impossible to please Him. But when it comes to the condition God wants in all of us, 
It is absolute, utter helplessness. Helplessness. Sister Carter Conlon preached, uh, Sister Teresa Conlon preached a wonderful message Sunday afternoon on that very subject that out of our weakness we become strong. Tell me, folks, what was it but helplessness that uh, in the condition of the children of Israel at the Red Sea, mountain on both sides, uh, Pharaoh's army coming to the rear, and the Red Sea in front of them. Isn't that not, is, is, is that anything other than helplessness? What can they do? They're absolutely helpless. Remember the one million man army that, of Ethiopians and 300 chariots that came against Asa and Israel at Marasha? And listen to the prayer of King Asa. Because he came to the point when he saw this million man army of absolute, utter helplessness. There was no way out. And listen to his cry. Lord, there's no one beside thee to help in the battle between the powerful and those who are helpless. So help us, O Lord our God, for we trust in thee and in thy name have come against this multitude. Let not man prevail against thee. And the Lord routed the Ethiopians before Asia and before Judah. This great king said, O God, we, we face an enemy that we can't handle. There's no way we can figure this out. There's no plan. There's no option. There's no strategizing. Oh God, unless you come down and give us direction, unless you come down and win this battle for us, there is no hope. No hope. I'm helpless. But whoever causes one of these little ones, Jesus said, who believe in me, to stumble or to offend the little one, it's better for him that he a, mill, a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and he be drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, Jesus is warning not against child rapists here, though, though you could apply it to that. He's not talking about abusers of children because he's talking about a spirit, spiritual kingdom here. The whole context is a spiritual kingdom. But he's talking about somebody that so angers him. And this has to deal with what they are teaching. And what he's saying, there are going to be false teachers who offend young believers with a gospel that caters to self-ambition and self-will and self-love and self-motivation rather than dependence on me. And he said, any man, any teacher, anybody comes to you and gets you away from your total dependence upon me, anybody that tells you that you can do it on your own, anyone that gets you to turn to the flesh and try to work in flesh, I want to tell you something. If I ever hear another clever preacher in the pulpit, if I don't vomit, I'm going to scream. There are so many clever, clever preachers and clever pastors with ideas just pouring out of their system and totally neglecting prayer, totally neglecting the house, the, the, the secret closet where the Holy Ghost whispers directions. And, and, and you hear it, and folks, there is nothing more damning to the kingdom of God than a clever preacher or a clever deliverance. Something that doesn't touch your heart goes over your head. It sounds beautiful and flowery, but it's not born in fire. It doesn't do anything. Jesus said, better a millstone hung around their neck and cast into the sea than to bring this kind of offense into the kingdom of God and into my house. He said, to think of those who would stand in the pulpit or teachers or others who say, hey, hey, uh, God gave you a good mind, use it. You know how to do it. And, and, Folks, I, I think many of the seminars and all of these how-to seminars must grieve the heart of God because they're giving people all of these ideas and concepts. And God says, where am I at in it? Where are the children? Where have all my children gone who are dependent on me?
Brother Ravenhill, a great old prophet who died a number of years ago, <coughs> was in one of my meetings. And he said, some of you people have, you live on tapes, he said. How-to tapes. He said, some of you have enough tapes to build a house. You don't have bricks? Build a house out of your tapes. Let the wind blow it over. Never forgot it. That's the problem with the prosperity gospel today. And that's why it's offended God and an entire generation of Christians. It's put a stumbling block before their eyes. Because they have sought the goodness and they have sought the good things of God without the obligations of obedience. If your hand or, or foot offends you, causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your eye offends you, causes you to stumble, pluck it out. Folks, I prayed for years and years for a revelation on that. Because I couldn't understand if, what in the world could I do with a hand that would offend me because I got another hand I could do the same thing with this hand. And if, if there's something in this eye that I, I have to pluck out, I can still see out of this eye, so it doesn't make sense to me. And then I, I began to see it in the light of what God is saying. Here, it's in the context of this childlikeness, this dependency on the Lord. And you know what he's saying? If, if, you're, if you're going to sit out in your own hand, you're going to take things in hand, in other words. You're going to do it yourself with your own hand. You're in danger. Pluck that thought out of your mind immediately. Cut it off. If you think you're going to run around and work angles and scheme and plan, and you're going to run here and run there, and your feet are going to take you away from the prayer closet and dependence on me, better, better to go into life crippled, in other words, totally dependent on Jesus, because you can't get anywhere, you can't do anything. He's trying to show us how serious he takes this matter. Better to go through life. Crippled means helpless. The word actually means helpless. Than having two feet and two hands and be cast into eternal fire. Because, folks, if you're going to take it in flesh, if you're going to try to figure it out, and if you're going to accuse God of not being faithful to you, and you're going to go out and work things out in your own strength, in your own will, in your own uh, mind power... It's going to lead you out into a realm of flesh and you're absolutely going to run in that direction and, and so fast that the mercy of God can never catch you because you outrun it. There were two individuals in this teaching circle. There's the child and there's the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then he says, become as a child. To who? Become as a child to who? To God himself, to the Heavenly Father. The disciples loved Jesus. They had admitted to him, we believe that you are the Son of the living God. But I wonder if they really ever truly uh, had the concept of who he really was. The Holy Spirit dealt with me in prayer. He says, David, who is this that you pray to? Who is this that you go to? into Times Square Church and worship. Who is this that you raise your hands to? Who is this you preach about? And here's, here's, here's what this whole thing is about, and I want you to, to catch it. There are people here tonight in this service, and you say, well, I can relate to helplessness because I am in a situation now that's over my head and I can't handle it. And I'm speaking now under the anointing of the Holy Spirit in a special way and I don't know to who. But I want you to hear it in the Spirit. Now, I, I <coughs> talked to a sister whose husband was had a, a, a very top executive job and his pay was cut, his bonuses were cut, their lifestyle was in danger and they were beginning to lose things left and right and she <coughs> went to her neighbor who was a Christian and sat there 
after breakfast they would get together and they would talk about how panic stricken they were and everything was going wrong and they're going to lose the house perhaps in the car and this other Christian lady told me who was telling me the story said I feel guilty I listened to all these things that are helping and God's blessing me and I feel guilty just listening to her and my, my point is that these people were panic stricken because things were beginning to be taken away from them they were losing the things, so it proves that their heart was in that. They, they, they were all wrapped up in these things. Folks, when you die to these things, and when you ask the Holy Ghost to start cutting the strings, God can trust you with things, but you're not, bar, you're not married to them. And when you begin to lose them, they don't bother you because you know that you are a child and you have a Heavenly Father that loves you. And there is no true father who works against one of his children. You know, I've told God many times when I'm in a hard place, God, I know one thing, you don't work against me. You will never work against me because I am your child and I'm totally dependent on you. You will never work against me. You work with me, but you do not. God's not working against you. If you're a child of God, he is not working against you. Get that in your mind. These people think God was stripping them of everything. And you know, God was working against them. God was not working against them. He was working for them, trying to break the love of things in their life. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Standing by that child. Now you look at that little child and place yourself there. It's not enough. And here's where the problem is. It's not enough just to acknowledge that you're helpless. Because if all you do is acknowledge you're helpless, that's going to lead you into worse despair. <clears throat> Helplessness in itself is no merit. There's no value to it if you say, yes, I, I know I'm helpless. I know I can't do anything. You see, standing right beside that little child, and what, what, what the illustrated sermon is to these disciples, you must come as a little child to me. But there stands next to that child, and perhaps that little child has, has just uh, jumped up on his lap and is resting quietly in the bosom of the blessed Savior. And there's the picture. It's not enough to say, I'm helpless, but I am a child of the living, everlasting God of creation. He is God to me. If God said, if you be a child to me, I'll be God to you. I'll be God to you. And that's what God said to me when I was praying. Who, who is this that you're praying to, David? Am I God to you or not? If I am God, I am all-sufficient. I am all-knowing. I will hold nothing back from you. If you ask me to expose anything in your life by the Holy Ghost, I will expose it. And if it's not exposed, don't dig something up. I'll be faithful to you. I, I may allow you to be stripped. Because when you really seek the face of God, He stripped you. He stripped you of pride. He, he stripped you of self-sufficiency. You know, this church has been needing space. We, we, we started negotiations last January on this space next door. 75,000 square feet or so there on, on those three floors. And we, we had all the work done, and it should have been closed by March or April at the latest. And every we get a call every two weeks. It's about done. It's done. Here. I just, till finally, I went to prayer. In fact, it was supposed to have been signed this past week. That was the last. I heard, I heard from the, the leaders of, of the all the whole thing. It's a, it's a, it's a mega uh, problem because there's so much paperwork and everything else. And I, I went to the Lord in prayer. I said, God, what do I do? We need space in this church. We don't know where to put the people. We have no place for the Sunday school. We, we have no place. We are, we are renting space everywhere we can get our hands on some empty space. And, and I went to prayer. The Lord said, David... 
who am I? I said, you are God. And he said, who are you? I said, Jesus, I'm a helpless child. I can't make a call. I can't move it. And, and God said, you know something? If you really believed that I was God, you would know that there's no devil in hell. There's no fallen angel. There's no human being that can stop me. So you, you've got to know that if it's being delayed, I'm doing it, not the devil. God says, you don't see the whole picture, but I do. You think it's a delay, but I'm saving you some trouble down the road. I'm working things out that would have been disastrous for you. And the church, he said, if you just give it to me, you don't make any calls. You don't try to work it out. You don't threaten people. You don't. I wanted to get on the phone. I, I wanted to get on the phone and burn the ears of every lawyer and, and say... I'm going to call fire down out of heaven and burn all of you up. <clears throat> now, you're laughing at me, but you've been thinking the same thing about a lot of your problems. What a peace when you find how helpless you are. What a peace. Because then you have no option but to turn it over. What are you going to do? You're going to get mad? You're going to get an ulcer and die. You're going to live in unbelief. You can't fight it. You say, Jesus, I want to turn everything in my life. Not just the space. My children, I, I, I just have to repeat this. You heard me tell it. This is five years now. And, you know, Gwen's had five operations for cancer. My daughter, Debbie, ten years, ten years ago, cancer, same kind as her mother. And they called a cluster. And then Bonnie, five years ago. And I, I, I came apart. I said, well, that's too much. All my women and my family, all. And she was in El Paso, and I went in the hospital, and the doctor just told me she was all doubled up in a fetal position and in pain, and they, they had this little atomic thing they were going to put in there to kill, a radiation thing, and everybody had lead on them. And uh, I thought, if they have lead on them, and she's got that implanted, what's it doing to her body? When the doctors and nurses have to have lead, uh, those lead aprons and uh, I went out in El Paso right near the Mexican border and uh, I said God I can't take this it's too much and I just for two hours there were no cars I just walked down this lonely road and wept and cried and pleaded with God and after having wept it all out for about two hours still small voice said, stop. And he said, let me talk to you, father to father. Your father to body. <clears throat> and then he said, David, <clears throat> she has two fathers. She has you and she has me. Now tell me, which one has the most power? <laughs> I said, you do, Lord. Now, you love her, David, but which one of us loves her the most? You do, Father. Which one of us wants her well? I said, I do. He says, I want her well more than you want her well. But I have the power. He said, now, I'll tell you what you do. And he spoke to me very kindly and like a child. He said, oh, David, if you just put her in my hands 
You never again have to pray about her health as long as you live. If you'll make a commitment and just put her in my hands, they had just told me she had a 30% chance to live. Put her in my hands. And I will let her live. He said, would, would you rather put her in my hands and let me run her life and do what is right for her because I know where she's headed. I know her future. I know her life. I know how long she should live. And if you will do that, put her in. He said, would you rather have 30, 40 years of having her with you uh, out of my will, doing it your way, or would you rather just put her in my hand, whether I give her three months, I give her a lifetime. It'll be in my hands. You'll never have to worry about her again as long as you live. And folks, as sure as I stand here, I laid her right. I saw the Father's hand in the Spirit. I saw His great hand, and I just laid Bonnie in her fetal position in my Father's hand. And I went back to the hospital with the greatest peace. And to, I pray for her protection. I pray for everything uh, about her and my, my children and, and wife and daughters. And that's been five years. She jogs five miles a day. And God has kept her in hell. And she's become a testimony to so many people. And I have committed her, I've committed my family into his hands. Now, the hardest part of all, I'm trying to commit me into his hands. And if I can get there, I think... Folks, I had a lot more, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm about finished here. Uh, are you getting the idea that you don't belong to yourself? If you keep on doing it, you're going to mess it all up anyhow? And if you just come like a child and say, Jesus, I, I don't have rent money next month. Come on now. I'm going to talk straight to you. I, I, I can't pay my bills on time, Lord, my bills are piling up and I'm hurting. I don't know where to turn. I don't know what to do. And rather than have panic, go into the secret closet of prayer and say, Jesus, remember what, with his close, remember what Paul said? He said, you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. People in the New Testament church had lost everything. And he says, they took joyfully the spoiling of the goods. They were so in love with Jesus but you don't find any of them starving to death. You don't find any of them committing suicide. You don't see any of them in panic. They took it joyfully. There was something of dependency on Jesus and the Heavenly Father that, that he was able to see, that they were able to believe that God the Father would see them through. I make you a promise tonight, church. I make you a promise on the, on the authority of this Holy Bible. If you will lay down all your doubts, all your fears, and just say, Jesus, I'm your little child. You said you'd be a God to me if I'd be a child to you. You said you'd be a God to me. You know what that means? I'll be everything you need. I may chasten you. I may let you go through some testing times. But it's going to come out right. It's, I am not going to fail you. And he's not going to fail any of you. I make you that promise. God will not fail one of you. You're not going to have to go to jail for unpaid bills. God will work a miracle. He works miracles. when it, God is God's more concerned about you than you could ever be concerned about yourself. God has everything under control, and He is not going to fail you. If you just put your childlike confidence and say, Lord, I'm going to depend on you. You show me the way out. You talk to me, Lord. I'll spend time with you, and you show me the way out. Jesus said, except you come as a child, you can't enter the kingdom of God. You can't know me in my fullness. You can't know me in intimacy. You can't know me at all until you know me as a child. That you just put your bosom, your head on my bosom, and you rest. And let me work these things out. He has ways and he has means that you know nothing about. And if you'll trust him, he'll bring it to the past. Folks, I, that, that building now, 
I have no concern about it at all. I've, if He wants it to happen, it'll happen. If not, we go on blessing His holy name. We don't get mad at God. We don't question Him. We just praise Him. If God chooses, He could take Bonnie tomorrow. But it's all in His hands. And what a wonderful way to learn to live where there's no more sweat. There's no sweat. There's no panic. You say, God, I put my life, my children, I put my, my livelihood, I put my home, I put everything in the altar. I give it to you, Lord. I'm going to just seek your face. I'm going to love you and trust you with all my heart. And I'm going to commit it. I commit it to you as a child. Will you stand, please? Well, this has been a simple message. Very, very simple. But will you take it to heart? Heavenly Father, we pray now that you speak to those in this congregation who are being severely tried and tested. Even now while I speak, today has been a hard day. Lord, I speak prophetically right now because there's some people saying, Brother Dave, this has been one of the hard days, one of my hardest days, one of my hardest weeks, and a very difficult time that I'm going through because I don't see anything happening. I pray, and I try to trust God, and I try to be dependent, but I don't see my prayers being I don't see it happening, and I'm, I'm getting down now where things are getting desperate, I think. Lord, you're never desperate. There is never a desperate moment with you. You have all things under control. God, I pray that you speak faith. I pray that you speak confidence in the hearts of the people tonight that need it. If you're here tonight, you say, Pastor David, that's me. I, I, I am in a place right now where if I don't turn everything over to him in total dependence, I'm going to get terribly discouraged. Maybe some discouragement's already set into your heart. If you're here tonight and you're backslidden, you're not walking right with God, up in the balcony and down in the main floor, come and join these. Not right with God or cold toward the Lord, come and join these that are coming right now. All right? Either come forward, look at this way, please. As you were coming and you're standing here, the Lord put something in my heart. He told me that many of you up here have been very worried. That's the word worry. Worried about the future, about rent and about food and clothing. Rent, so many things that, especially here in New York with all the expenses and how expensive it is and, and with children and so much temptation and, 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 and family problems. But I still have to believe what he said that Nothing is impossible with him. Nothing. It's, it's, it's either that or there's no hope. And more than that, that we are to do what he said to cast all our care. And that's what a child does. You say, but if you tell me to be like a child, well, what do you mean? How can I do that? First of all, when you pray, when you talk to Jesus, say, Lord, I have no answers. I have no way out of this. And a child has to be told what to do. Tell God that. God, I'm a child. I am dependent upon you. You're my father. I'm your child. Now, if, you, if, if, if there's a way out of this that you want me to do, there's something I have to do, you have to tell me. And when I had children, my children were little, I had to tell them what to do. I had to correct them. And, and God corrects you, but he also tells you what to do. And my children asked me, I told them. And if I'm, a heaven, if I'm an earthly father and tell them what to do, he, the heavenly father, how much? He'll tell you what to do. He'll not let you be lazy. He'll not let you just sit around. You have to go to him and say, Father, I am your child, and I have a need. <clears throat> you, you either meet it or tell me what I'm supposed to do. You give me the direction. I wait on you. You see, what I was talking about, people just do it without waiting on him. You wait on him and get direction. Usually, it, it's, it's something that you, you haven't even thought about. It, he has ways that you can't conceive. Sometimes you'll just say, just stand still. Just be still and let me work this out. Don't panic. You know, if you really go to Jesus and really pray, you know the first thing he's going to tell you? First of all, he's going to say, he's going to call you, my child. 
hit by your name. He's going to call you, my child, Joe, Amy, whoever it is. And then he's going to say, don't be afraid. Have you ever had God tell you that? Father ever tell you not to be afraid? How many have heard the Lord say that to you, don't be afraid? That's the first thing he's going to tell you, don't be afraid. Will you believe him when he tells you that and say, all right, Lord, I'm not going to be afraid. But what about my problem? Then you say, Jesus, I am going to turn this over to you. And I, I, I have no other way. And I want to do this because I love you. But now, Father, be God to me. Show me your power as God. Come, God, into my life. Come, open doors. We got a letter from a lady at the office the other day, and she'd been out of work, and she was in panic, and she said, oh, God, I, I don't know what to do. He said, just wait another day. Just, just pray. Trust me right now. Waited another day. She, Of course, she'd already put out of her, 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 she'd gone everywhere looking for a job, and one of those places she went called her, and she got her job that next day, just to the point of total despair. And, you know, it's, it's not good to trust him after he's answered prayer. That's, that's the right song on the wrong side. Remember I preached? You're singing the right song after. Oh, thank you, Jesus. But yesterday, where were you? Are you ready to give up your own ways and say, Jesus, I want to be a child to you. I'll be a son. I'll be a daughter. You'll be God to me. Will you raise your both hands to the Lord in surrender and pray this with me, Jesus, I surrender not only my sins, but my will, my way of thinking, my ambition, my desires. Oh, Jesus, I don't want to do it my way anymore. Help me, Lord, to come into your presence and walk with you just as a child. I can do nothing of my own strength. Jesus, if you couldn't, I certainly can't. I have to do what my Father tells me to do. So direct me. I'll wait on you, Jesus.